welcome visionary costume designer Ellen Mirajnik. Philip, you're so kind. <laughs> you're so kind. <laughs> Got to give let's you a good introduction. Yeah. <laughs> let's give that one to me, and I'll just take it with me everywhere I go. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Ellen. Oh, my pleasure. My I, pleasure. I have to say, Ellen has um, been, um, just on a personal note for me, but f to Ellen, Ellen has been um, a great supporter of me throughout my career and also one of the... Um, the kindest and uh first i think designers that really showed me um uh that she personally cared about me so i think that that was one of those things is like she would call me sometimes just to check on me to see how i was doing and i really appreciate that and i love you for it so thank I you, love you too. Yeah. <laughs> i love you too so i'm gonna start with one very boring question just because everyone My wants to pleasure. know which is <laughs> how did you come to this crazy field of costume design by total accident. Okay. Um, I think a lot of costume designers come to it by total accident, but mine, my accident occurred when I was, I designed ready to wear junior sportswear mm -hmm. for seven years and I was totally bored. And I didn't, I didn't want my own company. I didn't want to um, continue on in the fashion that I was, which was, I was a designer and a merchandiser and I did quite a lot of, of things. I had great responsibility. And um, with that, I was, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I was like at a crisis. And my husband at the time was working on a film in New Orleans mm -hmm. called The French Quarter, <laughs> where a lot took place. Um, and I went to visit because I hadn't really been on a vacation in a while either. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful uh, boss at the company I worked for, Designing Clothes, and um, I went to see him, and they didn't have a costume designer. And, of course, the director said, well, you could do, be the costume designer. But the show, I think it took place in 1910 or something of mm -hmm. that nature, and there were no costumes and so on. And so the excitement of really trying to figure it out really like exploded in my brain. So uh, there was, my husband had a contact at Brooks Van Horn, which was still in business at the time. Mm -hmm. And this was 1977, I think. Okay. Was that, no, 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 may, might have been 76, 76 or 77. Okay. And um, my um, husband had this contact. He worked in the in the movie business, and he had this contact at Brooks Van Horn. We called her. I went up to New York, pleaded with my boss so that I could stay in New Orleans eight more weeks. He knew I was miserable designing clothes. He mm -hmm. said, "Just put enough put enough uh, designs in the in the workroom for that amount of time and go," which I was quite blessed. Um, so. We did some Brooks Van Horn, mm -hmm. and I hired some seamstresses and such and had to find some pictures of what this world looked like because it was the world of prostitution, of course, in the French <laughs> Quarter <laughs> right. in 1910. And it all took place. And, but, oh, oh, yeah, it starred Virginia Mayo, the 1940s Warner Brothers, actually. Mm -hmm. I think she was on contract with Warner Brothers. She was a beautiful, but I think that Virginia must have been about, I think maybe late, late 70s mm -hmm. when she worked with us, and a bunch of girls, and um, that was the start. That was I the mean, start. I, well, I went back to New York, and I realized <laughs> I didn't really want to do, my boss realized I didn't really want to do um, um, fashion anymore. Mm-hmm nor did I want to do it. And I was really jazzed by um, the film business, the film making a movie. Was that was that transition based on you recognizing that it wasn't so much about the clothes that you liked figuring out character? Like, was that kind of no. what that started? What, what was no. that? What was that? No, it was always a love of movies. A love of movies. It's okay. always a love of movies. I think that the transition was simple. Simple, be simply because clothing was our currency you right. know and so I was curious and a designer and an artist and a painter and you just figure it out and I had learned a lesson early on mm -hmm. in fashion from a very 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 savvy fabric 
um, supplier. And he said to me one day, he said, you will be very successful if you learn to deal with, no, how did he say it? If you learn people. If you learn people. If you learn people, you'll be really, really successful. And I said, what do you mean? He explained it mm -hmm. quickly, which I can't right now. Mm -hmm. But it was really the right, the, the right thing to say because that was what was applicable in the transition to movies is that you learn people really quickly. And I guess I had, I just had a, a, a love of movies since I was like a little girl and went to the movie theater and looked up in the sky and it was all sprinkly yeah. you know, stars. So I, I love movies. I love, it was a, an escape still is to this day mm -hmm. and it's a place to dream i love that because i think that that's one of the things that people kind of forget too is like when you say it's the place to dream and it's an escape it's something that often um can get lost and i think that when you find that joy i think that then it can show up in your work and i think one of the things that i i can speak as a testament to ellen as far as when she's working too is she consistently has that joy but she also is consistently learning and trying to find trying to find I guess the core root of the 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 issue at hand but then spreading that to the rest of her team um can you talk about a little bit in terms of like your collaborations with your team like when you when you're working together certainly yeah um I love working with a team I I really love working with a team mm -hmm. um I, I I don't think any man is an island you know but um it just is a my point of view but working with a team what I really try to do is try to hire the best of in every single category that one works in and what the team needs. Yeah. So whether the team needs, whether it's a made to order show or a not made to order show, a shop show, I want the best shopper. I want the mm -hmm. best um, cutter. I want the best milliner. I want the best age or die or distresser. I want the, now, that's all fine and good, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't always happen. So it'll have to be the second best and so on and so on down the line. But I really, really try to really put together a team, number one, that is the best, but number two, most importantly, that everybody gets along. Yes. And so the camaraderie within the team is just as important as the skill and the talent to me because without it i just don't want to i don't want to hear the nya, 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 mm -hmm. nya, nya. it is a waste of time and it's a distraction and not saying that it has to be work 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 of work, course but keep your keep your mind clear and so i don't think that i'm um, i'm the boss i it sits on my shoulders mm -hmm. for sure and if you're dressing extras you better know exactly I don't need to dress them. Yeah. I don't want to go near them, frankly. Yeah. But you have to know what my aesthetic is, Correct. even if you're a day player, because if not, it'll just throw the whole balance off and Correct. I don't dig it. So I could get a little, <laughs> I really try not to anymore, but a little <laughs> riled about how many times do you have to, you know, e you either know it or you don't. You either but know what I not, demand, yeah. actually, what I really, really demand is yeah. honesty. Correct. Honesty is number one. And if you say, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know how to do it, that is a blessing. Correct. That is a blessing. And so whether we find the answer within the team or a member of the team, I, I really, really feel it's important to delegate responsibility and really own it in 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 delegating the responsibility i delegate to my assistants or mm -hmm. assistants whichever kind whatever the situation is as much responsibility as they could bear yeah. or i'll test it to make sure or unconsciously it happens yeah you know it just isn't so it's not because i don't want to do something i just want everybody to be an active member of the team there is not one person that's more important than the other. One thing that I want to say that I want people to, especially just if you're learning or even if you're just you, you've, you're a fan of costume design and you know how it works. Um, Ellen's strength in terms of what she's talking about, she talked about at the very beginning, which was knowing or to learning people. 
And that can be applied on a, you know, on a superficial level, it can be applied to costume design, which is like learn people, learn costume design. But Ellen, I think, took it a step further, which is she actually learns people like in real life, like meaning she learns her crew. She learns the strength, the weaknesses, the things in between. And the honesty that she's talking about is the transparency of being able to all work together. We're all moving in the same place, Um, I think. But also honest, I would say also honest to um t- each member be honest of whatever is asked of them correct correct which that part in itself it's a it's a well-oiled machine in the sense that as long as you're being honest you can find a way to figure it out it's like i think that something that i've noticed is um that ellen leads she's our leader but she also i've called her this before and i'm going to put her on the spot now she is a creative amplifier and what i mean by that is so many people when you work don't know how to lead and trust. So they hire you and then they second guess or they micromanage. That's not Ellen at all. She doesn't have time. So she's very much so I'm gonna creatively amplify. So she trusts you to do your job. And it's it I, I remember we worked together on Maleficent. Right. And I remember second guess remote remotely. Yes, remotely. We weren't in the same place because she was in London and I was here right. in, in LA. Right. And I remember completely second guessing myself and breaking down that I didn't recognize that she trusted me. So I was like, she's like saying, go do this thing. And I'm like, okay. But I, in my mind, I'm thinking like, should I be doing that? It's like, no, Ellen says, go do that. She's trusting you to go do it. So it was one of those things where I had to really recognize. And then I felt more creative and then I felt more trusted. And then as we went along in the process, things got better just from feeling like, Hey, I can breathe and do my job, but I also want to deliver because this is the part that I've said that I can pick up and do. And I think that when working with you, that was probably one of the things I saw the most is creative amplification I and not remember that yeah, too. and not creative draining, which is some people can oh. literally drain you um, because you're constantly just, you know, anxiety. And I didn't feel that at all. Um, I felt I'm glad. That's yeah. good. I mean, I think that what Phil just said is a perfect, perfect example Mm -hmm. of how one works on on my team and what's important to work on my team. And frankly, why do I just want people? I mean, the the flip side of it is why do I want somebody hanging around that like to get me, you know, the pencil and the paper, (laughs) whatever, fix my computer? (laughs) I like that too. Yes. Fix the computer part is very, very, the pencil, no, but the, the computer, yes. Um, but that being said, I think that everybody should have an opportunity to grow. Yeah. And with an opportunity to grow, you just want some. You want them to flourish. You want to see their eyes go whoa, 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 whoa sparkle mm-hmm. all around. Because um, we work in a hugely demanding field that is, it's like opening a corporation every single time you co- go to bat. So. I would like to see any corporate leader or a head really put together in mm, four to ten weeks the working operation that we have to put together in that length of time. I want to see somebody who thinks that they really run a a corporation, (laughs) a big corporation, come in and put one together in the time that we have to work. And what I mean by that is that that is a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not just a bunch of people in a room buying clothes, making clothes. Uh, No, it's figuring things out every day. That's one thing that I will say, too. Um, Ellen brought up a really good point that's really important when you're going into this field as well, is it's not, it's, she just defined it. That's something that I think everyone needs to know moving forward, which is there is a full functional job to being a costume designer. And she's laying it out right now, which is it's not just a bunch of people just kind of fiddling around with clothes. There's a full thing and it has to be efficient. It has to work. And then the pipeline between that is it's also creative right so it's like i think that one of the things i always think of ellen is like a boss like and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean it's like a boss i'm like a boss yeah like a boss lady (laughs) the boss lady in the sense that like you get the creative part but she's also managing and making sure that the that the business side is turning out right and then she's also kind of putting in you know putting out fires here fixing this communicating and kind of keeping everything together and i think that that's something that those traits are what 
I think need to be their inherently their costume design traits, but they're also just like you know management or boss traits, like someone leading the sh- like great leadership skills. I think the leadership skills are really important. I, yeah. I don't. I think that leadership skills also come from a place of confidence. Yes. And you know, it's not to say if you ha- you're not confident, you can't be a lead. I'm not saying that, and nobody Phil wouldn't say that either. Mm-hmm. It's you just have to take a breath and know that you can be the captain of the ship. You have yeah. to say, well, what if somebody taps me on the shoulder tomorrow and says, "You have to be the captain of the ship." Yeah. What are you gonna do? Jump overboard? I mean, are you <laughs> gonna like take it on? Right? <laughs> You're gonna take it on. So there's uh, in understanding how a costume shop works, mm-hmm. or even how a film set works, and then how a costume shop works within a film or a stage or any place else that we might work um, in exhibition. But that being said, putting together that shop, you have to know the pieces that are necessary to make the best production that you possibly can. Make the best story, film, whatever whatever you're working on. Whatever you're working on. That doesn't matter. Script. We'll just say text. Uh, to make the text be the most fabulous, beautiful, uh, alive piece of material that you can make. You have a very, very, very demanding job ahead of you. So what's most important is that that cooperation that you've just built is solid. Correct. That the foundation is solid because when it isn't, it's murder and it just it almost piles on top of each other right it's horrible it's horrible it's it's horrible when you don't work in sync Mm -hmm. and it's horrible when you don't have a rhythm amongst the group because you can't get your work done (laughs) that's correct because it's due tomorrow (laughs) i mean it's just not possible now it's impossible (laughs) it's impossible (laughs) we're laughing about ellen also designed um uh the cinderella with uh, rogers and hammerstein cinderella with brandy and 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 whitney and which has now become a a little funny meme where people use them singing impossible to 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 a funny effect yeah (laughs) (laughs) speak speak to me about i mean let's go back to that just for a little bit and speak about like especially at the time what that meant in terms of diversity that visual of Cinderella. I have to, pardon me, I have mm-hmm. to say it was the most exciting thing that had come across my plate in I, whatever the amount of years was that I was working, maybe 10 years, mm-hmm. 15 years. It was the most exciting thing. I mean, not only was it Cinderella, but there was a color to Cinderella that was just fabulous. Like how in God's name did somebody not think about this a long time ago? Mm-hmm. Um, but apparently, if I remember correctly, Whitney always wanted to do it. Mm-hmm. If I remember this correctly, Whitney always wanted to do it. Now, I don't know, because this is a Cinderella from 1950, well, I'm bad at this, four, five, six, mm-hmm. Julie Andrews and... Um, not Julie Andrews. It was, was it Julie Andrews in the 50s? Well, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was on television. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I don't know if Whitney wanted to be Cinderella mm-hmm. or she always wanted to be the godmother. That part I don't remember, but I know that. But the thing about it was is that it was so brave at the time. Mm-hmm. It was so brave. And how could you not want to be part of this courageous bit of filmmaking that nobody has done before? Yeah, right. And so it's it was just exciting. But once again, it was as much of Brandy's story as it was Julie Andrews' story. You know, black, white, I've just done a Cinderella that's mm-hmm. Latin. I'm, so that remain that you'll see yes. in 2021. But um, 
it is everybody's story. Correct. And so that's the most important part. But the it was a colorful presentation, mm-hmm. and it was it was jubilant. Mm-hmm. It was really jubilant, and um, we were thrilled. And I think, if I remember correctly, there were was it Deborah Chase was a producer. Um, and Neil Marin and, and Craig Zayden mm-hmm. and the you know and Rob Iskoff directed it. Rob Marshall mm-hmm. was the choreographer. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he directed if he had directed anything yet. Annie was close okay. in this time time zone, but I don't remember at the moment. And look at that. I mean, it was like fun mm-hmm. and colorful and just like the first of its kind and it was hugely successful as i remember it yes when it when it opened it was like i think it was done for the abc world of disney like on sunday night movie something of that i remember I, I think with my for, do you remember what year what year was this 90 96 i think we made it 97 it was 97 yeah, okay, 97 yeah. I don't so know. yeah which yeah that would have been like like middle school high school for me yeah my little my little sister i remember we watched this we watched the premiere of it all together as a family so me my mom my dad and my sister and uh on sunday night. I, yeah on sunday night i remember that when they used to do like prime time yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah so i remember that and i remember it just being my parents were really excited about it because it just showed it's just there was just nothing like it and they were nothing. like you know kind of like it was one of those mo- moments where they're like finally you know like finally we have something um and my little sister i remember really responded well to that like you know she was that perfect age where she was just like oh great you know you know i i recently got a letter i i i, I loved this cinderella mm-hmm. i really do i loved the experience of it i loved every single actor that played every part mm-hmm. oh, i we'll loved be. <laughs> um, I love the dancing. I'm just addicted to musicals. Mm-hmm. And I think it, somebody said, oh, Ellen, it goes back to fame. Remember you worked on fame. <laughs> that was a musical. I went, oh, right. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, see, I didn't like, think of it like that. <laughs> oh, right. Anyhow. So, but here was another musical mm-hmm. and it was a Rodgers and Hammerstein mu- musical. And that family was so nice. Mm-hmm. They were just ever so generous. Um, and everybody had such an amazing time. We all, my department and all of our actors, but Whoopi was great. Whoop, mm-hmm. Whoopi was great because as she said that. We had, um, <laughs> do you remember Michael Dennison? May yeah. he rest in peace. Yes, sure do. Well, Michael and I worked on so many movies together. Mm-hmm. He was like the other half of my brain. Yeah. And he did the most outrageous jewelry you ever saw mm-hmm. right and he did a huge amount for Whoopi. i okay. just didn't remember the story till right now yeah no this, please this uh, he did this crazy jewelry for her mm-hmm. so she comes in late we do her fitting and so on and so forth and we show her the jewelry because mm-hmm. michael had made it already and actually robin robin was Anne was mm-hmm. michael's assistant making the jewelry um and so she came in late. We said we showed her the jewelry, and she said, "I'm the queen. I'm not wearing that." <laughs> and we went, "Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> what would you like to wear, Whoop?" And she said, "We'll go to Cartier." Oh wow! <laughs> and she called Cartier. Yeah. The next day, yeah, I went. I don't remember if Robin came with me, but I know somebody came with me. Mm-hmm. We went to Cartier and picked out. Like we were in the candy like store. Like just like we're going to pick out the best. Yeah. We're picking out the best. And she said, don't forget to get me a nice ring. I went, of course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we came back the next day with the guard mm-hmm. and oh, hundreds of thousands. <laughs> thousands of dollars of jewelry. Oh, who, nobody looked at a price tag. Right. They were just going to be very you know, generous and, and promote it. Right. The necklace is theirs. The earrings must be theirs. I don't know. One of the ornaments on the head must be something that we broke off of, Mm -hmm. a piece of jewelry that was made. But she only wore the grandest. She said, this is, now I'm a queen. Now the queen. (laughs) Right. I'm the queen. And she was was just absolutely great, though. She (laughs) just was hysterical. 
And I actually had gotten, I, I was always very, very, very um, proud to hear, to say that I designed this because mm -hmm. there were many young girls that I've met along the way that said, oh, Jesus, you did that? Wow, that like changed my life. I watched that. I watched that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It was like, that was, I can't, oh, wow. And I just, it was always surprising to me of how many people, but how many people it really affected. It was. Until it, I got a letter. Oh, okay. It's not until, but, and I just received a letter, mm -hmm. oh, a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm from a young man who is part of the gold program at the academy. He's a young man who is hoping and learning to be a production designer. Okay. He was an Orthodox, an Orthodox Jew, mm -hmm. Hasidic Orth Orthodox Jew, who saw Cinderella in 1997 mm -hmm. and what it looked like and what it felt like mm -hmm. said he said to him i want to do that he left the hasids mm -hmm. he left his whole family mm -hmm. to become a production designer and he's a member of the the academy gold department and That's he said incredible. he changed my life and it doesn't get better than that. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. How right. can you like, wow? And and it, yet it is just another project, right? <laughs> but at the same time, for people, people take it in and it affects yeah, them. Yeah, it was very. It really broke my. It, it it didn't break my heart. It made me really tearful. Yes. And it was just, it was it was great. It was really really great. It was a very special time. Well, when I, let's take this one. Let's transition into you have a project coming out that actually uh, falls in line with your being on the on projects like this that are changing the way that we view things and moving forward, which is Bridgerton. Oh, the Bridgerton. So let's talk about Bridgerton. This is a Shonda Rhimes project mm -hmm. from Shonda Land. Um, tell us a little bit about this. Just give us an introduction as to what it is. Bridgerton is a sexy, scandalous. <laughs> saucy story about the Bridgertons. The Bridgertons are a family. It takes place in London, mm -hmm. Regency, England, 1813 in London at the at the dawn of that year's social season. Okay. So the social season is a season that the girls there are balls mm -hmm. so that the girls can find their husbands right and so you think you just like say that over and over again mm -hmm. and it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> in this day and age that's what you're gonna all work on well it is but mm -hmm. it it is a lot of fun it is kind of taking regency london and spinning it on its ear they're very very relevant mm -hmm. and um it, it's not feminist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there are very very um there are female driven perspectives mm -hmm. um and there is a whole multicultural um diverse cast and Nothing kind of fits the checklist of 1813 London. Yes. Regency period. So I, I have to say this, um, and I'll, I'll bring it as an introduction. I, I spoke to Ellen on the phone, and she was telling me about this project. And I had heard, I hadn't seen anything about it. So I get off the phone with her, and I say, okay, let me go look it up. So I go, and I just play the trailer, and it's the first thing that I noticed. I was like, wait, what? The 1800s? And it's like, it's completely diverse. And in that world, it's not, it's not, I don't want to say it's an issue. It's just everyone is who they are within this setting. And the it, way life is supposed to be. The way life be. is supposed to be. And instead of going back and then trying to like for like formulate it or into what would have been or trying to draw attention to it, it literally just doesn't exist. And I think that 
playing in that world already in, in itself, I just I, I literally looked at it and I was just like, it's the first thing that I noticed. Now, granted, I wish we lived in a world where it wasn't the first thing I noticed, but the first thing I noticed was like, oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then <laughs> like, I think one of the main one of the main guys, the, in the, lead. So, the lead in the social, he's like, uh, is black. He's or, black. Yeah, so he's I, a really tall, handsome. Yeah, black so man. I just I said, "Whoa!" Like I was like, it was just seeing that already was a, was immediately like I was like, "Oh!" And then of course, then the Ellen and of it all. Black. Yeah, no, <laughs> but then the Ellen of it all. I was like, "Of course, Ellen did this." It's like it's so great. Um, so walk us through like when you when you found out that that was kind of how they were going to start to think about the characters. Well, I have to say this. I I, I would have to backtrack okay, five please. seconds, please, and say this is that. This is Shondaland. Yes. This is Shondaland and every, I mean, Shondaland is not huge. It's not like Disneyland. It is made up of very, very talented group of um, mostly women. Mm -hmm. There are some men, but mostly women Mm -hmm. who have come together to create stories. Uh, This book. The uh, the Bridgertons, which is really they're actually eight books, and it's eight different story names, right? right. So um, it was written by Julia Quinn, mm-hmm. and apparently, as I was told, um, Shonda loved these books. Yes, and she bought them, and she basically left ABC after many, many, many years mm-hmm. and moved on to Netflix, mm-hmm. where this became the first project that she produced for Netflix. Yeah. So it was big and it was bold. And the thing, and what's great working with um, Shondaland is this, is that this is not a historical drama. Mm -hmm. This is a period historical time, but it is not historical. Right. It's fictitious. It's fictitious. And I use this like the word fictitious mm-hmm. in many different aspects mm-hmm. because that allows certain liberties. Yes. Um but what happens at Chandaland is this is that they have a very, very specific um they have very specific aesthetic. Yeah. And it isn't an aesthetic of historical accuracy. It isn't a, an aesthetic of precision or preciseness of okay we're going to do Phil today and yep. Phil is going to be in that amazing shirt that has skulls and it's colorful mm-hmm. and we're not going to do Phil exactly you don't think about any exactness right unless you're using somebody as a kind of a model as or a model an is- or inspiration yeah. okay and what what they're always interested in is it that it should be beautiful, mm-hmm. luscious, glamorous, and um, aspirational. And in the aspirational world, that sets a whole other whole <laughs> other thing. I mean, after working with them and after doing actually just to go back a second, the greatest showman and mm-hmm. Cinderella mm-hmm. and working in this fairy tale world of a period. I like, I revise everything. So am I a revisionist costume designer? <laughs> I don't know, but I, nothing is safe. No bounds are sacred when my vision gets a hold of it. Yeah. So in creating the aesthetic and what that aspirational aesthetic is for Shondaland is simply that it needs to have all those adjectives. Yeah. And actually appeal to a modern girl, a modern audience. And so I don't think it's really fair to bastardize anything Mm -hmm. about what the period looked like. So what we do, the one thing that's authentic is that we keep the silhouette yes right keep the silhouette that's about it yes <laughs> and then and, but that that i think that's the fun part i mean like the best thing just watching what you were doing here is that you keep the silhouette but then you can play and you're not bound by the rules right right in any category right. um and i think one thing that i had always kind of thought about even just which is why i was so drawn to this was there's certain time periods like my wife loves vintage clothes like she uh-huh. loves she loves the 50s and the 60s right do we like what happened in the 50s and 60s? 
No. <laughs> but project wise, if there was a project that told a story in the 50s where you got to play in that world and nothing like race or anything wasn't an issue, how fun would that be? So to go back to something like this and to just say, I'm going to put these people in this thing and play and then across all mediums, besides just the race, just talking about even just clothing, silhouette, um, uh, what colors were used, what fabrics, all that. Just all, playing Well, we with changed it, everything. Right? Okay. I mean, on Bridgerton, it, it was a very remarkable project that I kind of. I didn't dive into. I mm -hmm. somewhat s backed into. Yeah. <laughs> as the best way to put it, because they called me in the very beginning mm -hmm. um, of that year and said, have a look at this. And there's a woman who runs their physical production who I know for many years. Her name is Sarah Fisher, mm -hmm. who's she's fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm calling you really early to let you know. Yeah. And I went, yeah, OK, so. And I read it, and I went, oh. I'm, I only read the, the pilot. Okay. Um, now, mind you, all of this kind of episodic stuff and TV is all, like, new to me. Yeah. So I just, like, picture it as, like, one huge movie. Right, a whole like movie. Like a 10-hour right. movie. Right. Right? Yeah. Because you are going through all those characters and stories. Anyway, so, but I only read the pilot. Mm -hmm. And so Sarah said, well, what do you think? And I said, do you have enough money? Yeah, right away. Like, is there enough money to do this? That's all. I, I mean, because I had just finished. I was working on a laundromat, but I had just finished Maleficent mm -hmm. in London. So I really was quite aware of what was in and around in Europe, mm -hmm. in European houses, and, of course, in the British houses. Um, there was nothing. It was there was absolutely nothing. There was nothing that you could take and say, okay, how many are there? Uh, there was nothing. There was nothing that would equal their aesthetic, but more importantly, there wasn't even a costume to right. rent. Right. Right. None. So, which meant everything had to be made. Walk us through that because everything being made, when everything, I, everything. I, everything. This is including shoes. I mean, everything was made. Um, How many pieces, Ellen? Um, well, first I had to make a costume house. Uh huh. Okay, so let's do that. So, costume house. So, first I had to make a costume house. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I was working with a very specific such a special man, Kenny Crouch, okay. who is like the master of masters in the UK in supervision. And he went and he found an, just a place to work from mm -hmm. that, I don't know, shoot, I wish I knew the square, I, I've never seen any place bigger than this. <laughs> but this, but you needed a place to not only work and house your staff and who was going to be members of the team and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, but you needed to for the stock and to fit. So it wasn't as big as Angels. It's not as big, big as Western, but it was still a costume house for everything that we needed from soup to nuts, inside and out. Got it. And um, we wound up building uh, 7,500 pieces. I read some piece of publicity today <laughs> <laughs> that said 9,500 pieces. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't 9,500 okay, pieces. Okay. I don't know. You could maybe like if you count one shoe and one shoe, but no. It, wasn't, it was 7,500 pieces. But those 7,500 pieces mm -hmm. were also were, po were parts of costumes. Right. In other words, there were pieces that were made and then there were um, – gowns done there were you know uh waistcoats done there were all different kinds of so pieces much work. so it wasn't like one 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 right. one one no 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 right so you had to first of all you had to make the stock and so the the stock was made between spain and paris costumes mm -hmm. and italy i think we did a few at torelli and Budapest, mm -hmm. where Budapest, yeah, yeah. my favorite tailor in the world is in Budapest. There's nobody better, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we made some in England as well. Okay, but uh, that's for the stock. 
All the men's stock basically came between Spain and Budapest. The women's the women's stock came from Budapest, Spain, Italy, and some in New York. Wow. Yeah. All over. So not only did you I have to like go back. Mm-hmm. You had to find the space, organize the space. Right. Fine. Kenny did that. Mm-hmm. That was perfectly great. The fabric had to be found. Yes. So we're fabric coming from everywhere, I'm imagining. From Florence. You know, there's a great, great place to go in Florence where there's massive amounts of fabric and stuff. It's always worth a trip. Um, We just had to get fabric. I mean, it was. And, and you know, the funny thing about it is, is that you think that there's a lot, but there's just a little. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. So... (laughs) Were there any fabrics you fell in love with and there was just not enough of it? No. Okay. You can't be in love. You can't. Yeah, you can't. You can't can't be in love. The only thing you can be in love with is your pillow. And and actually, (laughs) when you see the work come in, that's when you can be. Or when you see another store filled with fabric you haven't seen before. That you haven't seen before. Okay. Because there is, it's like, you know how we always say there's only one thing in the world or there's only like two stories in the world and so on and so forth. It's like a famous old saying. Well, there's only a certain amount of fabric in the world. Yeah. And you're not making any fabric. Although we, I think that we did weave some fabric. We wove some fabric. So going back to the Bridgetons, Mm -hmm. here's the Featheringtons. Okay. Um, The Bridgetons were the upper class family. Okay. That was old money. That was old generational and so on. They were the richest. Right. (laughs) They're the richest. They're the family. And then there's the Featheringtons. Mm -hmm. And the Featherington lived directly across the street. (laughs) And they are like new money. Okay. (laughs) And they want to fit into this social circle got it and of course this mom wants all her daughters married off right as does the bridgerton mom yes i mean there this is very snobby and very social conscious and um fishing okay that we're doing here um but as you could see they are the total opposite they're the complete so talk about their color palettes well, but first of all, okay, okay. I, I, I see we have to like go back. And yeah, we have to keep going. Yeah, we do. <laughs> it's fine. But you know what? <laughs> in in the process of it, uh-huh. in, the, in the process of creating this, okay. this show, we actually, I skipped a couple of parts, mm-hmm. um, is that I had it budgeted. We only budgeted one episode and then basically budgeted the show by what they were saying it, it would be. It was far bigger. It was like three times the size. <laughs> it wasn't it? Isn't that always the way? <laughs> but anyway, but but because it, we're talking about a lot of money, mm-hmm. I really, really wanted to make sure that um, they they were willing to spend it. Yeah. Because this, uh, you, you can't get involved in something like this and then be a smidgen of a way in and have somebody say, "You can't spend that money." Mm-hmm. And that being said, we kept saying, write smaller, write smaller, write smaller, because every time you write your full imagination and your world, that's money, 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 money. Right. So once knowing that they were, it was right before the new year and then over the new year, then it was in that January, it was like, okay, do the recce. Now do the recce. So I got on a plane, went to London with Kenny and John Norster. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, who were there, and we kind of did the recce, and we said, oh, this is like kind of thrilling. We Nobody ever did a costume house before. Yeah. This is kind of really cool. So there, oh, I, I'm like just a challenge junkie, you know, so it's like just, it was a huge challenge. I'd never done that before. Right. Just setting up a full house. And, setting yeah. up a full house. Yeah. And making sure there was enough clothing to do and you know you bu- go out and you buy fabric and fabric and fabric and fabric and it comes in and you're looking and go oh wow this is way too much mm-hmm. and then it's gone in five and seconds and then it's all gone and it's you're like okay yeah oh <laughs> they didn't have that much more so 
But w- after all of that and uh, going to the design process, mm-hmm. um, we knew we had to keep the silhouette for the most part. Yeah. Men and women. Yeah. But what we did was immediately shift the color palette. Mm-hmm. And w- although the Bridgertons are very, very um, traditional yeah. in a color palette, you know, they're like pretty baby, baby powdery blue and white filigree and and so on. And traditional colors of a very, very powdery soft palette, mm-hmm. very, very soft. Um, that kind of Wedgwood blue would be considered dark in our palette. Okay. okay? So we were lighter than that. Um, Tiffany blue, as much as I love, it would be li- lighter than that. It'd be lighter than that, right. It's like a breath of a color. And then, then come the Featheringtons. <laughs> <laughs> and as they're written in, really, in the books, mm-hmm. the, she's, um, Penelope is written wearing the ugliest dress you ever could imagine <laughs> in a terrible citrus color. Right. So there were all of these markings that were, um, Chris Van Dusen adapted to our screenplay. He was the creator. He adapted the entire series. Um, and then we could have a good time. So off of that came the picture that you saw before yeah. of that 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 particular picture between the two exterior pictures best represents what their world was. So what we interpreted that kind of co- color combination to be would be more kind of bold Versace-esque. Right, right. Okay. And so then we had to find the, the palette of the whole entire show, which was a mix of it all, and find a way to diffuse it and use costumes over and over and over again, which we found fabrics that did not many magical things. Mm-hmm. And um, then we proceeded to figure out the balls and see how to do oh I don't know there's more than 10 balls in the damn thing right so it's like (laughs) well the here's the thing the cool thing that you've shown even visually you use some terminology that I just want to go back to really quickly which is this is a fun exercise in almost it being what it is which is the Bridgertons are very like their old money very much so like the top of the social ladder the richest right and their color palette is very refined and beautiful and romantic and then you have the Featheringtons which are it's it's new money it's literally like we just got all this new money how it, I don't want to say almost it's almost like the yeah Beverly Hills yeah like Billy. exactly it's like how obnoxious can we be it's not obnoxious but it's like it's a bolder like we have money and we can afford all these things and then and we could show it off and we can show it off so it's like a it's it's like also to like a taste level thing versus like what I think it's a sensibility, sensibility as well is that yeah. because you know they feel that they can they should be seen mm-hmm. and they should be bold but it's an unskilled it's an unskilled in that time if you will um, breaking of all manners right right you know? they don't purposely do it. They don't. There's nothing purposeful about the Featheringtons. Yeah, she is just at Portia Featherington, Mrs. Featherington, mm-hmm. is just as committed to getting her daughters married off as Violet Bridgerton, Bridgerton is right. about just Daphne in that season. In being there. Okay, got it. Okay. So it's it's kind of scandalous and saucy, and it's there's sex and there's language that you wouldn't expect mm-hmm. and there's language that's used that you wouldn't expect okay but it's there's okay. also proper english that's used it's all a mix it's the biggest mashup you'd ever want to know that's super fun and it is fun and what it allows you to do it's really always interesting to me <laughs> is that when i started um to design when mm-hmm. i when i actually my career began I was really put in a, a cat. I did contemporary film, and I loved doing contemporary film. The I just loved all contemporary film, and I could not be hired when no one would hire me to do anything that was a period film, ever. 
And I went, well, that's okay, because I really don't like doing period and having to be so exact with every detail and so on and so forth. I would rather be in the process of making history or being the source of history for tw 20 years from now mm -hmm. than it is replicating history and interpreting history as a project. And lo and behold, that all became true for the films that I did in the 80s. Yeah. It all became reference for now. Um, and But when I've gotten to do period films, mm -hmm. it's like I just, it's a fairy tale period. So I just mash it up in a way that I think other designers might rack me over the coals about. Historians certainly will rack me over the coals about. But it does present a new way of looking at if your daughter, mm -hmm. for example, was of the age to watch this, mm -hmm. she could relate seeing the girls in the show. It's a very girly show. Okay. It's kind of like people have been saying it's or people that I've spoken to have been saying it's kind of like Gossip Girl but it takes place in you know it's like the Regency version of <laughs> Gossip it. Girl it, it's, a, it's a very girly show yeah. there's a lot of gowns there's a lot of girls there's a lot of stuff okay continues stuff I mean we had all of that you know we had made 7500 costumes but then of course that doesn't include accessories and flowers and more flowers and more flowers and we had an embellishing department we had a jeweler we had two milliners we had four cutters we had how many two, crew members did you have 278 278 but that includes the standbys i mean still that includes the standbys <laughs> we had 278 members of the costume design costume wardrobe that's incredible team but they are 278 people that I'd like to kiss on their feet every <laughs> single day because without that extraordinary team and also for this show, it was so big and so expansive mm -hmm. that um, John Glazer, who I've worked with for over 20 years now, he was my assistant at a certain point, and sometimes he became my associate and sometimes a co-designer and so on, depending on the project. And he designs his own mm -hmm. shows. Um, his best show is Gotham that he designed. Gotham. And it's like genius show um, till the end. But I brought John uh, over, and he, I, he will be the co-designer. That's he is awesome. the co-designer of credit. And John and I, the two Americans, with an entirely British team. Mm -hmm. You know, the funny thing about it was is that it was that we have a different eye for certain. The British, the British team, the the Brits have a different kind of eye. It's a different aesthetic. It's yes. different. It's a different approach. We, well, I mean, you look at that and you go, "Oh, loud Americans," but <laughs> <laughs> loud Americans. <laughs> But yeah, maybe, and for that. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, it was very, very helpful because we can infiltrate from many different areas. Right. And what we found was that, you know, each and every member of the team and Brits through and through and through loved the adventure of shifting it to another another sensibility. Yeah. And that was really fun for us to see. This shift is, um, can we actually go back one image if possible? Because um, I thought that this, I want to go back to this image. It was just super powerful. It's of Taraji and, uh, and our lead. I want to see if we can get this because I want, I want okay. you to talk about this because I just, that, that image alone, there's uh -huh. so much here. <laughs> so can you kind of. Well, okay, so she is Lady Danbury. Okay, Lady Danbury. She is Lady Danbury. That's Ajua. And um, she's a wonderful woman. And she is Lady Danbury. And Lady Danbury is the, you know, I never really knew if they were related or not. So I okay. won't say mm -hmm. if they were. But she became um, 
virtually his mother. Okay. Okay. It's his aunt. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's his aunt. Our lead is reggae. Mm -hmm. Um, That that is Simon Simon Hastings. Okay, Simon Hastings. And Simon Hastings is the Duke of the Hastings Manor. Okay. Um, Lady Danbury is the relative. She's the aunt. Okay. Right? Yeah. Of that family. And through circumstances, he, his mo- mother died in, at birth. His father, now we see a little bit of this. So we see a little bit of the, what is it? Late 1700s. Yeah, mid, mid late 1700s. That we didn't mash up. Okay. We kept that like what it was because it was kind of a black and white image of in as far as the flashback is concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, but we learned that his mom has passed and at birth and he was born with a speech defect. Okay. Okay. And his father rejects him. It's very sad. Very, very sad, really. Done really well. And Lady Danbury who's a member of the family, comes to his rescue. Got it. And she becomes basically his mother till he is a grown man. And she teaches him everything. He becomes like A plus straight down the line. Mm -hmm. But he says to his father... Well, I shouldn't tell you this part. Yeah, see, like, let's wait. Yeah, I I can't That part, let's wait. I'll I'll hold on that. Yeah. Anyway, he goes away mm-hmm. and travels a bit. Mm-hmm. So he travels around the world and, and so on. So he has a totally different sensibility, but he has no intention of marrying. Okay. And lo and behold, it's like, I think the book is called The Duke and I. So it's the Duke, mm-hmm. that man who is the most gorgeous, lead, romantic, leading man you could ever want to kind of sweep you away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a great story angle that they use, but he and Daphne get get together. Okay. The the Bridgertons, and of course the mom is thrilled that he's really aristocratic makings there. You know. I just think the visual of it is is kind of impressive. I think it's just things like this, even in contrast to like when we were moving forward in the images, just seeing this and it's all together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that this is going to be something that people are going to really get into. And I think it, it just allows everyone to partake in this story. Like you said, the scandal of it, the going back and forth, all of the rist- the um, aristocracy, all of that stuff. And all of it, I think it's going to be an interesting thing to play. And I think that your design work here um like you said you can see the bold choices i think what'll be interesting to me is to see how costume people respond to it in this oh i don't really ever want no, to see it don't the, tell me no, Just no, no like write me a note maybe yeah They'll yeah go, oh, no she did that no 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 I, th- stuff again. I think it's gonna be great actually because it'll be fun like i think the more you know about the rules you the more you know what's broken and then how fun it is to play so i think right. the, i think it's more so in looking at it and saying like the but silhouette you know, is kept the silhouette is kept the, right the, there's another thing with it with the color palette is the fabric the fabric yes okay there's no historical fabric in here if there is it's just because i liked it right at the time you know <laughs> there's nothing historical about anything okay there it, it, it the biggest challenge was okay the one thing that you can get let's say in fabric is solid taffeta solid silk solid that that palette right mhm Okay, so how do you take it and then make it different? That's the key. That's, well, that's basically the key for the entire show. See, and now that's perfect, Ellen, because we are getting a wrap up. We're almost done. Okay. But I, I okay. W- but no, no, no. But I would say that gives everyone something to look forward to. This show comes out on Christmas Day. Yeah, correct? So I think it really would be a fun Christmas present. It's a really yeah, yeah and yeah. I think it's a good one for everyone. So make sure you guys check it out on Netflix on December twenty fifth. Right. Um, there are eight episodes. There's eight episodes. Okay. And um, are we expecting anything after this? Well, my work schedule <laughs> 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 will take me. No, actually, I think I'm going to do a project in Los Angeles for the first time since the laundromat. And Wonderful. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully it will all come to pass with Steven Soderbergh, my favorite. 
It was very nice. I got to meet a little bit. I know bit you of did Bailey's that time. Very, very kind. Um, I love him to pieces. <laughs> there's nobody I would prefer to work with. I really, there's, uh, he's a genius. Spoke and, very highly of you, too. Oh, well, yeah. that's nice. Thank you. But he's really the genius. And he makes you be even better at what you at your. So is is he a creative amplifier for you? He's a huge creative amplifier. See, there we go. (laughs) Huge, huge. So we have that. And then another film that will be released in 2021. I'm not certain. I I know they're counting so heavily Mm -hmm. on going into the theaters. Yes. Is, um, well, it was once called Rebel Dreamer, and now it's called Cinderella, the official movie, but I don't know what it's going to be called in okay. the end, but it is Cinderella. Yes. And this is with Camila Cabello, who yes. is, a, she's fabulous. Mm-hmm. She is an amazing, but there's a whole new take on Cinderella. Perfect. It's a whole new take, and Cinderella has become, it's a fairy tale period, I must make that clear. Okay. It's not a contemporary show. But Cinderella has taken on the 21st century woman. Okay. So we've got some fun stuff coming from Ellen. Um, Ellen, tell everyone, all of our viewers, where they can follow you to keep up with these things. Um, well, please, if you'd like to follow me on uh, Instagram at by Ellen M. Facebook is my name. Mm-hmm. Twitter is my name, but I really don't use that Twitter too much. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I really don't. I retweet a lot, but I don't Not really on the know Twitter. how to do Twitter. Um, where else do you have? That's it. That's I mean, it, Instagram right? is good. I also, I have to say this because I love her. I'm giving a shout out to Ellen's daughter, Lily Mirajnik. Oh, Lily Mirajnik. Yeah. <laughs> Just to say hi. So hi, Lily. We miss you. Hi, Lily. We miss you. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Marilyn Vance, who is our, our podcast creator. Thank you so much, Marilyn, um, for this great opportunity. Thank you very much, and Marilyn. And thank you, Phil Boutte, for no. this amazing interview. <laughs> thank you very much. And I also have to thank um, our sponsor, which is we are sponsored today by Warner Brothers Studio Costume House. So thank, thank you, you so Warner much, Brothers. Warner Brothers. Shout out to Tangi. Um, and uh, follow me on Instagram at uh, Phil, P-H-I-L underscore Boutte, B-O-U-T-T-E. And join us again. And also, this is our last one, so we want to say happy holidays happy to everyone. Happy holiday, everybody. And Have let's a safe finally one. go into 2021 and get out of 2020. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Al. Thanks, Phil. Thank you to our sponsor, Warner Brothers Studios Costume House, a one-step resource for your production costume needs in the film industry and movie professionals. Warner Brothers Costume House features over 60,000 square feet of highly organized and easily accessible costumes. Thank you to our viewers. Be sure to follow Designing Hollywood Podcast on social media and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, and YouTube channel for complete past and current episodes. Also, now available on Amazon and Siri Voice Search.